Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or evening to you all, whatever you are in the world. Welcome to spotlight number seven, the last of our marathon of sessions, which I trust you all have been following since the 17th of February, as part of the UN's foundation Big Brainstorm Initiative. Today, we will be spending time together until 10 East time. If you have trouble understanding audible English, please turn on the captions at the bottom of your screen. To our audience, please feel free to introduce yourself in chat box below. Tell us where you're calling in from and what you're most excited about today. It is only fair that I kick off the introductions. I am Claudette Salinas Leiva, Next Generation Fellow for Future Generations at the United Nations Foundation. As a Mexican researcher, I'm, constant, I'm constantly thinking about new ways of unlocking our potential to live a better future for the next generations to come. For the past year, I've researched international law's role in protecting future generations and what international stakeholders can do to leave no country behind. Today, we have a phenomenal panel of speakers and many change makers and innovators who have been with us since the big kickoff of the Big Brainstorm last week. There were over 250 of us who joined to explore, prototype, and launch initiatives to tackle some of humanity's greatest challenges. We also launched the 24 innovators who will be leading their teams in brainstorming around solutions to some of, war of the world's most complex issues. These innovators are skittled in all corners of the world, but mainly from the global south. Now, shout out to Felipe, David, Wara, and Jacob for the wonderful work they're doing as innovators in the Future Generations Action Group. It is my pleasure to be supporting them on projects related to a new social contract, youth for foresight, and indigenous knowledge, and bringing countries together such as Italy, Argentina, Bolivia, and Uganda. We're looking forward to sharing it to the public soon, so remember to stay tuned. The UN Foundation is committed to supporting young change makers in shaping the global agenda to tackle the world's most urgent challenges. Our future agenda program is designed to deliver impact for the next generation, which are young people under 30 who make half of the world's population, and future generations, the 10.9 billion people yet to be born this century, most of whom will be born in continents like Africa and Asia. These spotlight sessions are one way to support us through thought leadership, entrepreneurship, policy making, and sharing insights while engaging in discussions. To kick off this spotlight titled Thinking, Planning, and Acting for Future Generations, we will begin today's sessions with a fireside chat with Arati Krishnan from Strategic Foresight at UNDP and Maxim Stauffer, Chief Executive Officer from the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance. Each speaker will have three minutes to respond to each question, so we have ample time for the Q&A segment populated with questions by young people through the chat. We will also have a second fire chat with Eiko Sukamoto, Senior Manager from Schmidt Futures, and Taylor Hawkins, advisors for our Future Agenda team at the UN Foundation. We will then go into a fire round where all speakers will get to give a tip to young people on how to shape the future. So with that bit of a context setting and to swiftly ease out of my little monologue, let's dive into today's session. Looking into the future is always challenging, especially as progress on the sustainable development goals has started during the pandemic. Unexpected crisis and the pressing development needs of, needs of today tend to take center stage in political discourse at the expense of matters of the future. Future generations will largely be born in low or lower middle income countries, while richer countries still control and consume the overwhelming share of global resources. Any future generation's agenda must reconcile this imbalance and belong what the multilateral system is already delivering for future generations. So let's kick off our first fireside with a reminder to speakers to please stick to time so we have ample time for the Q&A with young people at the end. To those of you who have joined us, please do write your questions during the session and we'll do our best to capture them all during the sessions to ask of speakers at the end. So, starting with fires at chat, Max, given you work closely with policy networks to ensure they're aware of the importance of resilience building, with the imperative to consider future generations growing greater, 
as more people are to be born than alive this century, what new insights or perspectives do you think need to be brought to the multilateral system to enable it to think better, plan, and act for the future? Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you very much, Claudette, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I think I have like just like a few things to say. One is that acting for future generations can actually happen right now fairly fast and fairly urgently. Uh, I think when we tend to think about the future, we end up often in uncertainty paralysis where we actually don't know how to predict the future. We don't know what the actions actually are, but actually we often know what to do. So like we know um, many decarbonization strategies. We know how to strengthen health systems. Uh, we know how to price risk in um, development investments, for example. And I think in, in long-term governance discussions, there's often the proposal around to build like an, an IPCC equivalent for X, Y, or, or Z topic. Um, but actually, we, we often know what to do, and um, it's more like a question of action rather than a question of uh, a knowledge and reduction of uncertainty. So just want to be clear that we can actually do things uh, in the present, and it's not as complicated as uh, one may think. Um, another thing that I would like to say is that um, thinking about future generations ultimately relates to our relationship to, to risk and risk governance as risks are potential events that may happen in the future. And um, when it comes to very large, big risks, um, I think we all agree that the chance of collapse this year or next year is fairly small. Um, and it is pretty obvious that in one year, the world will probably not collapse. And that's true. Uh, but if we look at longer timescales, um, because we take future generations into account, risk essentially accumulates. And over like a century, for example, we know that like the risk of collapse is one in 10. And one in 10 is pretty significant. Like would you jump on a plane that has one in, one in 10, 10 chance of collapsing? Probably not, right? So um, I think as we take future generations into account, the way we think about risk and the priorities we have for the, for the global policy system um, might be different. And, and in that light, I want to like double click on the role of uh, technology in this regard. So if we not only look at the long-term future, but the long-term past, over time in history, uh, technology has been responsible for very big jumps uh, in uh, humanity progress and big jumps in shaping the trajectories uh, in the world. If you think about the printing press, the invention of the telegraph or nuclear power that led to abundant energy, but also nuclear weapon, um, a, large of, a large part of the opportunities and risks that we have in the present and in the future depend on, on how we develop uh, technologies. And, and that must be kind of front and center of discussions, especially as now we have chat GPT coming and being uh, democratized. And I think that relates to a broader point I want to make is that the point of the, the need for risk informed development. Um, over the, the, the past history, often the shocks to development were of like natural origins, like natural pandemics, earthquakes, and tsunamis that either reversed or slowed down uh, development. But nowadays, most emerging and large scale risks actually stem from development, from the way we make economic decisions, military decisions, technological development decisions. Um, and therefore, there's a need for risk-informed development, like planning for long-term uh, development for future generations while accounting for the risks that we might create as we develop um, societies. And that is a, a slight shift in the way we need to think about development because we realize that humanity has much, uh, much influence on ecosystems and future populations that we need to take this into account um, in the long term. I will uh, stop here. I'm happy to answer other questions and engage in the, in the discussion. Thank you. I agree that race is something we tend to overlook, but it's crucial if, one, if we want the next generations to exist and prosper. Uh, we're happy to have Ceci Lebungu as our fourth speaker. And Arathi, is there anything particularly insightful from your work in anticipatory capacities that you think is worth sharing with us? Uh, Claudette, well, sorry, was that question for me or for Cecil? Uh, for you, Arati. Great, thank you, and thanks for having me. So um, I think Maxime Max raises some really good points, and it's it's the basis of uh, when we talk about what does it mean to be anticipatory. 
for us, it looks at what are how do we anticip better anticipate the types of emerging risks that might uh, come up in not just the near term, but the midterm and long term? And then how do we ensure that we make the appropriate investments to either uh, mitigate it or to perhaps look at how we diminish that footprint of risk? Um, I think what's important when we talk about building anticipatory capacities and the link to governance and risk is to understand that risk is no longer a siloed issue. We, we live in the time of a poly crisis where risks are very interconnected. So we can't have a conversation about climate without having a conversation about social justice, without having a conversation about technology and what those impacts are. Now, usually, and this is part of the work we do, which is, which is difficult, is when you talk about risks in silos, usually risk mitigation mechanisms look at the impact in the near future, so meaning in the next couple of years. Um, and we're able to rate it from impact and probability. Um, and But when risks are intersecting, when you have multiple things hitting at the same time, it makes it a lot harder to price it and therefore to assign probability and impact. And when you can't price risk, what happens is that you can't assign governance mechanisms for it. And usually when you can't assign governance mechanisms for risk in the, not just in the near term, but the midterm and long term, it, the most disenfranchised in our society bear the brunt of it. We see that in climate justice efforts right now. We see that in technology justice efforts at the moment. So in terms of what are the important ingredients for thinking long term, for thinking of our future generations, in my opinion, we need to understand beyond just uh, understanding what future generations might want, which we can't, um, we need to understand what are the systemic structures of injustice and inequity that happen now, that occur now, and how might this be replicated or enhanced in the future? Because whatever our society looks like now, that's how it's going to unfold. If technology systems are already biasing people of color, minoritized constituents, et cetera, without thoughtful design, this just gets, you know, replicated into the future. My final point that I just want to make here, and this is a key part of, of designing anticipatory governance mechanisms, is no matter how good or robust our um, assessment, assessments are, our analysis are, we can never fully assume to know what future generations want, need, or desire, let alone thinking about future generations as a homogenous constituency. Our societies today are broken up into multiple communities that are already having different experiences um, of equity, even if they exist in the same city. So how then can we choose to say we know what future generations want without getting really specific about which groups of future generations we need? How are they going to experience life? If, if that particular group, um, a replication of their ancestors are already facing inequity, then what would their what would their experience be? So to understand the needs of future generations, I would encourage us to not think about them as a homogenous entity, to really understand the different groups that might make up, um, make up future generations, and then think about what authority we have today to stand here to make policy decisions that are probably not going to impact us right now, but will impact, um, will impact us in a generation to come. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Claudette. Thank you so much, both, both of you, and for mentioning that we need to understand the systemic injustices of today and the challenges of portraying future gen's interest. Now, starting with you again, Arathi, what urgent investments in the SDGs can have a positive and lasting impact in the lives of future generations? So I think this is a really interesting question because we are off track to meet the SDGs at the moment. We're completely off track. All the crises that we're intersecting, crises that we're experiencing, has actually had, has you know, has made negative impact on development gains. It has, and in some spaces, if you look at how women's rights are being, in some cases, in some spaces, uh, actually 
are regressing, how human rights are regressing, we are completely off track. Um, economically, it's really hard for us to recover, even though in some parts of the world that is there, but we are facing a global recession and that and that's how that is experienced and how that's experienced worldwide is very different. So in terms of critical investments, what I would, you know, and um, what I would say is we need to understand again, just coming up from my first point, how future risks might unfold? What, what future theories of harm might unfold from the decisions we make today? So I'm not even sure um, if we look at the SDGs and considering that we're off track in that, it's not so much an investment to how do we get back on track, but I would suggest that actually what we need to look at in terms of investments are how do we mitigate against the regression of development gains. So what I mean by that is all the progress that we've made over the last 50, 60 years globally, that's at risk of being reversed. So in terms of thinking about where we need to invest, it's not just about, yes, let's invest more into poverty alleviation, let's invest more into climate change, but actually getting really nuanced by what we mean by that. It's not just poverty alleviation anymore. It's how do we ensure people can live lives with dignity and, and well-being and not have to work three jobs? How can we ensure that um, we can have education that is speaks of our history as much as it speaks of the future um, so that people can make informed decisions? And we need to make very informed decisions uh, and investments into risk and not just siloed aspects of risk, but intersectional risks, uh, existential risk, strategic risk, and lift our understanding of what that means. Thank you so much, Charathi. Uh, Max, anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I think Arathi makes like many, many good points. Uh, I'm happy to build on, I think as a just direct response to, to what she said regarding the fact that we can't know the needs or the wants of future generations. I think this is this is right, but but there's a nuance there. Is that like there are there are, there are basic needs that we can assume to be fairly true in the future. Um, like we can suppose that future generations probably want to exist in the first place. Thus, avoiding extinction is probably a good thing. Or that future generations um, likely want to have a better uh, gender um, equality or be above like a certain poverty line um, and and those are fairly basic uh, life standards that i think basically are relevant now just like they would be relevant in, in the future um, and and the other thing is that i think we we can assume that future generations will want to design the institutions that are good for themselves and that means that in the way we design institutions we can um, design with uh, adaptation in the design of the institutions to make sure that future generations can update the institutions based on their needs. So to allow them to basically uh, realize uh, their potential in light of what they want. Um, and I think the, the question regarding SDG investment can, can help, help make progress on this. So the first point is that if we take future generations into account, that ultimately increases the value of SDG investment. Uh, because we move from a constituency from 8 billion currently to uh, 18 billion if we take this uh, century. And that justify immensely uh, SDG investment because the constituency is, is bigger, um, but also because the, the, the risks we can reduce via SDG investment uh, is also more significant. Uh, in terms of like more specific investments, what I would suggest or like suggest to think about, one is about investing in uh, access and transfer of technology in particular to like low and middle income countries. Um, this is in particular because we need more equal distribution of uh, technological benefits, but also because we need these countries to join a global discussion on how do we want to govern these emerging technologies. Um, and if they do not have access to this, if we do not foster transfer, it is very hard to engage these communities in, in how we want to develop uh, those technologies. Uh, the other element is more like investing in, in capabilities for low and middle income countries. Um, and that's, I think, um, to a large part uh, related to the question of like risk ownership or like the ownership of transnational crises. Um, when countries have uh, very scarce resources, it makes 
a very little sense to start investing in reducing global risk or like transnational risk. And therefore, there's a resortion to nationalism um, and to individualism as a result. And um, increasing the capabilities could also help these countries uh, focus on the more transnational um, aspects of uh, today's risks. And, and I think one, one other element I would take into consideration is that uh, when we think about the multilateral system and its mandate, um, it is deeply under-resourced uh, to deliver. Uh, the, the UN system has seven times fewer resources per employee than the Swiss government, but the mandate is, is so much broader. Um, and this leads to uh, very small teams, many, many small units uh, across the UN uh, that grapple with complex risks, uh, very complex topics and think about the future, but it's not just a few individuals or like a few a few teams that should do this. It's like very large scale agencies, organizations that would have the capacity to do this. And that's a that's a question of uh, of, of resources um, and, and and capacity. And that could also like reduce the problem of of turf wars and, and scarcity mindset that often like uh, prevents basically action um, at the at the UN level. So this is an area of investment that I would uh, recommend as well. Thank you, Max. Uh, thank you for highlighting the role of low and middle income countries. Uh, now, moving on to the second fireside chat with Eiko Sukamoto, senior manager from Schmidt Futures and Cecil Abungu, researcher from the Legal Priorities Project. Um, Eiko, as someone who works closely with young people in the student experience for RISE, what do you believe the role of young people should be in creating processes and institutions capable of thinking, planning, and acting for future generations? Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Um, so I work at RISE. Um, RISE is a program that finds promising young, young people and provides opportunities for life as they work to serve others. And so, as you know, I care deeply about young people and their potentials. Um, and so I strongly believe that the world's most important problems will be solved by the next generation of leaders. The world that we're creating now is one that young people will live in um, and their voices should be inclusive in the thinking, planning and acting for future generations. What do we know about young people today? They care deeply about critical issues and they want to be part of the solution making. Um, I've experienced this firsthand um, working on RISE. Um, what I've seen is that young people are full of creative ideas and they're unhindered by the reasons that something can't be done. Um, and they're more willing to collaborate um, and work together. I think young people also come up with a lot of fresh, innovative ideas. Um, for example, we have one RISE winner who is an inventor um, in the US um, and their project was to upcycle fish waste, fish scale waste um, and to use the, um, they use the fish scale waste and turn it into biosorbent to remove heavy metals from wastewater, preventing food and environmental contamination. So she is working on promoting global sustainability um, and developing a circular economy. And then we also have another RISE global winner um, who's a social justice activist. Um, and they're passionate about political representation and not discriminating against minorities. Um, and for her RISE project, she actually planned and host discussion events that brought together high school students and their local political represent representative as a mean to effectively reduce the negative perception that youth in her country have towards politics and politicians and how to bridge that gap. So I think in essence, um, in solidarity with young people, we should build an, a sustainable process and system for young people to be engaged and involved. Um, I have to say in managing our programming for RISE, we make sure that we're really intentional about bringing in the youth voices um, in designing our programming and that we can co-create things together. Um, and so making sure that our design is useful and if it's a viable idea, making sure that we have the structures that we can pursue it and execute it together. Thank you for hi highlighting how young people are our bridge to a fairer future. And looks like you're doing an amazing job and many young people. Thank you. 
Any thoughts you would like to add? Oh, is that question for me? Uh, for Cecil. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation, first of all. Um, so my name is Cecil Abungu, and I, uh, I do fish generations research. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I guess if, I, if I'm correct, the question was about the place of young people. Is that right? Mm, yes, I, I can repeat it. Um, what do you believe uh, the role of young people should be in creating um, institutions capable of thinking, planning, and acting for future gens? Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, I, I guess my sense is that the main role that young people could play um, is sort of... Uh, changing the way we think about what it, what it means to, to, to be just um, in the world. I think that the current mode of thinking about what it means to be just um, generally, for good reason, I suppose, prioritizes um, existing like problems that you can see outrightly. Um, but for us to fix the problems that we, well, yeah, the, the problems that future generations will face, um, the problems that the youngest people face, will face more than those who've lived already. I think you just need an, another kind of thinking, another way of thinking about what it means to be just. And my sense is, the, well, the people who can make the biggest difference are young people, as we see in climate change, for example, um, and, and in many other differences, in many other areas. Um, so my my own hope is that that's where young people can create a real a real change um, um, on what it means to be just and and a conception of justice that takes into account people who are not alive um, people who can't speak for themselves yeah thank you Sassi. that's some food for thought. Uh, now, starting back to you, um, why is it so difficult to address the needs of future generations in today's decision making, and how can those barriers be overcome? Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, hmm. So I'm just gonna, I guess there are very many reasons why, including psychological reasons and all, but I'll just stick to the most, uh, of the ones that I think are most obvious, and uh, that's, uh, um, I guess, I think uh, election cycles that are very short. Um, which, well, um, yeah, election cycles that are very short, which then force policymakers to uh, address the most pressing concerns, the concerns that um, people can see outrightly, um, because I guess they want to remain in office. Uh, and uh, second, um, an economic system that generally is uh, organized to prioritize uh, immediate gain, um, to prioritize uh, immediate need, um, to prioritize uh, uh, building significant uh, um, wealth uh, over, over, over thinking about other people who, some of whom are not yet alive. So um, I guess to me, those are the two most, most dominant reasons why um, barriers for, for the situation that we're in right now. Um, so what could be done about them? Um, so I guess um, the first thing I think is that um, what, what you, you probably, you might want to work with what you get, like you work with what you get. So you, you, you work with how people are right now and what does that look like so i feel like that looks like when you make policy today yes you make it well or you push for policy you make policy or you push for policy you make it taking into account the needs of those who are alive yes but at the same time you try to um infuse within it the the interests of those who are yet to be born um, 
and I guess Max ha has done a lot more work on this and how that can be can be made possible. Um, but like I think that's one way of of going around the barrier. Um, and secondly, I think uh, this is a little bit more radical, but I think there just needs to be a bigger campaign to see future people as human beings who will be alive, um, who didn't choose to live whenever they will live. And it's just not sensible that we continue in the in the way that we're continuing without thinking the, about that they just had have no no um, role to play in when they leave and we have we owe them more um i guess that's a more um hopeful um way to to go around that barrier yeah thank you for sharing your perspective Cecil, and for highlighting that we also need to start considering future generations as moral beings um, anything else you would like to add, Eiko? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think an another reason why it's so difficult is because the world's challenges are bigger and more complex than ever. I think, you know, the, the challenges that we're facing to get today, whether it's climate change or educational setbacks due to COVID, the racial gender and other inequities, um, we are living in a time where we have some of the greatest challenges. But at the same time, we do have better tools to solve these problems. And so we need a new generation of leaders that can deal with uh, the growing complexities of this world. But I also think that um, a lot of exceptional people never realize, never are able to realize their full potential for global impact because for many reasons, they could act last, lack, lack access to opportunities to develop their ideas. Um, they can face social or economic barriers. Um, sometimes they're not discovered or they're isolated. Um, and sometimes you don't know who these individuals are. And so it could be really easy to be um, lackadaisical. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to improve the way we find talented people. Um, and sometimes with universities and employers, we just rely on existing traditional networks. So we're actually leaving a lot of talented people on the sidelines. So how do we bring them into the fold, um, into the decision-making process. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to address today. Um, so, you know, the thesis of RISE is if one person can change the world, imagine what a network of exceptional people can do together. And so our value proposition is that we're gonna find talented people across the, the world um, and we can support their solutions that we can't even imagine today. And a lot of the, the challenges today are very complex and need interdisciplinary approaches. So I can list more challenges, but I think those are the ones that really come top of mind. And in order to solve this, we need to be more collaborative. We need to bring more young people into the fold and in, in how we design these um, and build coalitions and support systems, um, build networks, identify, continue to reach out to subject matter experts, policymakers, people can offer advice and support. Um, and that's also what we do with RISE is, you know, when they join this global community, they can collaborate, exchange ideas and lean on each other um, for support. Once again, it's very inspiring what you're doing. And as, as someone coming from Mexico, it's true that the talent pipeline, it's not something it's easy to reach out in global opportunities. And we needed to galvanize more action in the future gens um, arena. So now moving forward to our fire round, I will ask these to all speakers. With less than seven months to go to the SDG summit and seven years to the end of the 2030 agenda, what is your main tip to young people looking to shape the global agenda for the future? Each of you have two minutes to answer. And Max, let's start with you. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I think the, the puzzle at the core of your question is that um, we need to combine early careers with the need, uh, the, with urgency. Like we, we have young people that have early careers, but we need change fairly fast and impact fairly fast. And this is hard. Uh, because it requires to find opportunities where change can actually manifest. Um, and that's that's a puzzle, I think, for, for young people that is that is hard to, to wrestle with. Um, and what, what I would recommend is that um, you, you, you would 
focus on like finding your niche and where like you can make the, the biggest like difference. And I think uh, I would focus on like low hanging fruits. And in terms of low hanging fruits, I think um, they mostly lie at the intersection of silos or at the intersection of um, processes where many professions exist. Like most professions nowadays exist within silos and specializations, big societal spheres. Um, and as like uh, Arati said, a lot of the problems we have currently are multidimensional, systemic, and they relate to many, many different silos. And, and I think you could make a big difference by being kind of this intermediary between different fields or different sectors uh, or different levels of governance. So for example, if you're able to, to think and, and act globally, like in big brainstorm discussions or other things, and also act nationally in like local policy making, and then you can bridge both by feeling uh, you, um, one into the other, then I think you different, the difference you can make is much, is much bigger. Um, the same applies if you um, can work at the intersection between risk and development rather than one uh, or the other. Uh, the same applies if you can work at the interface between science and policy, because then you can inform scientists, you can inform policymakers, and you can do this job that is not currently like almost no one's job. And uh, you can foster the coordination between these silos, between these otherwise separate groups. Um, and this is, of course, like not sufficient to achieve big change, but it is a necessary component. And uh, because of the current professional incentives, this is something that people do not do. Uh, and this is something that young people could uh, could do, and, and it's a gap that they can, they can fill. Um, I think one thing that comes up in, in, the, in the chat a lot is that there's also a need to think about future generations and, and development in a much more positive manner than talking about risks all the time. And I know I do talk about risks all the time uh, because they're real and important. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, what's important to outline, and that's what also what young, what young people can bring to the table, is, is a positive and, and bright narrative about the future. Like the reason why we care so much and the reason why we have these discussions is because we truly care. Like we want the future to be good and bright and we think this is possible. And in the end, that's the narrative that, he, that should underlie action and youth involvement. It should not be a narrative of, of fear of collapse or fear of extinction. Uh, those things are just um, bottlenecks, barriers um, in front of the nice future that we want. And I would want future um, youth and future generations to kind of cultivate this narrative on and on and on and on. Thank you, Max. Um, Arathi, over to you. Uh, thanks, Claudette. Um, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Max said, um, and I would add to this that the role we play is to, that we can play, is to understand how change happens. And I think very often when most of us, when we first start out in the space of development or humanitarian crises or, you know, or social justice or social change, we think just by talking of, you know, like by advocating for a particular issue, the politics of change will fall into place. And that's not true. So we need to understand how policy actually changes. How do decision, how do we actually influence decision makers to make a different type of decision? And very often it comes down to the appetite for change and the appetite for risk um, of different decision makers, of different institutions. So merely saying something like, you know, we need to do X because X is the right thing to do, isn't going to cultivate change. People don't make different types of decisions because it's the right thing to do. People make different types of decisions because there's a valuable, there's a value proposition that underpins that. And that might be a little bit cynical, but if we want that hopeful, joyful future that is equitable for everybody, that protects our planet, that that honors our ancestors, that that brings truth to, to, to what we see and what we would like to see in the world, then we need to understand the politics of change. So my advice would be that do not assume that institutions will change if we come in and say, hey, we've got these right great ideas or these great new approaches. We need to understand how to actually influence that. How, do the, how does the influence of change happen in the corridors of, um, of these multilateral institutions of governments, et cetera? The second thing I would like to say is 
we need to be careful that we are not engineering a future based on our ideas of what it might be. And this is really hard to do because, um, you know, we, we carry our ideas of, of what that looks like, that that's inherent in, in our nature as human beings. But, you know, Ruha Benjamin in 2018 um, wrote then said, like, who and what gets fixed in place to enable progress and what social groups are classified, corralled, coerced and capitalized upon. So others are free to tinker, experiment and engineer the future. So who is at the expense of the great ideas that we have? Who gets left behind? People being left, be, leave no one behind isn't an accident. It's a, it's a result of bad design. It's a result of conscious design of, of, of exclusion. So making sure that we're really clear that whose needs of the future we are prioritizing, whose visions of the future gets privileged, and what, what is the trade-off of that, I think, is inherent. And as young people, my advice, and I don't want to speak on behalf of young people, I'm very, very uh, old, but in my experience, um, conversation about risk and politics of change are important, but ensuring that we are not just promoting a sci-fi technology, flying cars, utopian future is the own, because that's not the, that's not the vision of everybody. Some people we need we need dialectic reasoning and moral imagination and 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 that's when we can ensure that our our futures are just our futures are equitable our futures are right um, and my last point here that I'll just end on is to not assume that the ethics of the future are the same type of ethics held across the world. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, Cecil, over to you. Um, what is your main tip to young people looking to shape the global agenda for the future? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I, I totally agree with both uh, Max and Arafi. Um, and I guess I'll just build up from there and say, um, I think that one really useful thing you could do is just know what your country is up to what your country's position is on on the agendas that um, face uh, future generations, particularly. Um, this was actually from a conversation I had recently with someone, and I realized just how kind of detached I am with regards to what my country, um, what my country's position is on a lot of these issues, and how it mostly just needs some engage people um, to push um, to push hard for the, their governments to think about something or take a certain position. Um, and so I guess the big thing I'd say is just take a moment to find out what your country's position is. And if there's no position, of, if there seems to be no position, try to um, think of ways you could influence that. And one of them, easiest ways I guess you could influence is, is to begin by organizing so like sm even if it's like just small meetings um, initially small meetings um, putting out position papers like short position papers on something um, getting meetings with important I guess the important people who make decisions I think that that would be a very big difference so that's that's what I'm going to add to what Max and uh, Arafi have already said. Thanks. Thank you, Cecil. And finally, Eiko, what is your main tip to young people? And because we want to move to Q&A, um, please try to be short. Yes, I will be very brief. Um, and so I think this is something what Cecil was mentioning, but I would say my biggest tip for young people is to start small and in your community. Um, with, we have something called the RISE Challenge, where young people are able to demonstrate their talents through a project that benefits their community. What are the issues that they know intimately? How can they upskill in those areas? Um, and so how can they get involved in programs that can support them um, to take their projects to the next level or their interest areas? Or, um, you know, how can they get more interested in public service or for people who want to make the world better? How do you find the right 
support systems and networks that can help galvanize them to do so. So I would say that would be my biggest tip is to also just be persistent, persevere, um, because a lot of these problems are not going to be solved overnight. So to really build that resilience too, I think is going to be important. Thank you. Now, moving to our Q&A, we've tried to capture the different types of questions and direct them to the speakers who may want to respond. But I also encourage you all to respond in the chat if there is a question that you had loved to bring an answer to. And let's get to questions from our attendees. A question from Jacob Ellis, lead change maker at the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, and also a Next Generation Fellow with me. Um, let me go to Maxime with this. How do you measure the effectiveness of countries to take future generations into account, and how do you score them? How do you see progress? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I think this is um, this is a key area where we need to make progress. Um, I, I do not have a great answer to this. I, I wish that we would have metrics or indexes um, to do this. I think my, my two cents to this question is that the way we often think about like future oriented policymaking is uh, very often through the lens of representation and foresight. The fact that like we need the representation of future generations on the one hand, and then we need foresight to kind of predict uh, the consequences of policies on the future or then understand threats to the future and then reverse engineer what we need to do in the present uh, for the future. And um, we could evaluate institutions on these two fronts. Like, do they do um, representation of future generations? Do they do foresight? If yes, great, then we can evaluate how well they do this. If not, then they should improve on that. But I think that this actually misses a very big part of the conversation. I think a very big component of being able to act uh, for future generations is the institution's ability to act uh, preemptively and to act fast in the need for change or in response to crises. Um, and that is not just a question of representation and foresight. It is a question of uh, can bureaucracies adapt and pivot adequately? Um, can we make fast decisions without uh, end up in, ending up in authoritarian um, schemes? Um, can we um, spend the right amount of funding before crises happen? Uh, can we unlock funding rapidly like safety nets uh, when you have a shock such that we can uh, stop risk cascades that may escalate into global risk? And I think this, um, this character trait of institutions of being like kind of like preventive and, and adaptive is what I would try to measure rather than the representation and foresight aspect. Um, Thank you, Matthew. The key um, example of that is that we do have representation of current generations and foresight for things like COVID-19, we still fail at doing prevention. So there's something else we need to have in the picture. Thanks. Uh, now for Cecil, future generations leadership is not a new concept and some of our best experts are indigenous leaders. How can we bring indigenous expertise into the UN and the international system for how we think, plan, and act for the future? All right, awesome. Uh, tough one. Um, so generally, uh, I guess the, the, the answer I give is the the answer I, I've i thought about, um, but I, I presume there are better answers than this. So my sense is that the easiest way to do this is um, um, to get people who've, because I guess the fundamental problem is sometimes it might be difficult to, um, to bring to our table people who um, think very differently, um, speak very differently, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so in my own research, well, I, I've, I found that there are ways in which uh, you can be a middle person, middle man for those voices. And so like I'm finding, I think of myself as a middle, middle man for those indigenous communities in the work that I'm doing with regards to what they think about future generations. So I suppose the way, the easiest way I can think of this working out is that those people who are making decisions at that level 
try to find those people who've worked closely or have, have collected um, the information that they need from indigenous community leaders and then bring them to the table. Of course, the best case scenario is to actually bring those people to the table, but I can imagine that that might be a little bit complicated. So that's the one I've thought about um, so far, yeah. Thank you, Cecil. And Pikesh asked a question I want to direct to Arathi. Uh, how can we de do develop in the way that does not harm our resources and we can save our resources from, for present and future generations? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, how can we do development in the way that it does not harm our resources and we can save our resources for present and future generations? Okay, so I, I assume you mean natural resources there. Um, climate resources. Is that what, what the, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll respond assuming that. Um, so one of the uh, one of the more contemporary uh, idea of economics at the moment or of growth is that the way we've talked about development and growth and economic indicators have actually harmed uh, our planet. So the idea now or the contemporary view of how do we work within planetary boundaries. Um, and in fact, at UNDP, uh, two years ago, our human development report uh, talked about what does it mean to do development in the Anthropocene? And, and, and advocated for new type of planetary indicators to um, help guide the work. So, you know, as Kate Rayward for Donut Economics talks about, we can, we have to ensure that what we are doing is within the boundaries and parameters of, 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 um, care for our planet. So understanding that just continuous mining of our environment for just economic uh, growth is no longer appropriate nor enough because it's actually causing significant harm to our planet. So understanding what those planetary indicators are, including them in new metrics for growth and development. Um, and in fact, this is what I would suggest is we need, and one of the things we're thinking deeply about is what are some new philosophies and ideas of human development in, in, 20, in the 21st century? because the parameters of what um that was and the philosophies are still remain true but perhaps considering the types of uh, complexities we are facing the types of ethical issues we are facing we need different types we need to evolve those and that understanding of human development um and include that in in how we think about um development trajectories. I want to come to the point as well, if I can, just on indigenous groups and in ind indigenous peoples. Um, I think we are at a point where, you know, we often look at indigenous inclusion um, either as a tokenistic measure or just as how can they be stewards for uh, environmental sustainability. And in fact, indigenous protocols talk a lot about how we care not just for human and non-human beings, but also the protocols for how we relate with each other, how we relate to community growth and development, how we relate and plan for and steward future for the, for the future. Um, so I want to encourage us to rethink just how we in, um, incorporate indigenous protocols in our work, um, and also consider that, in fact, different philosophies and different wisdoms of what development means might actually be more helpful for us at this point, rather than this post-World War II idea of growth that we've all been working towards, right? So we Thank need you. to bring in different um, wisdoms. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, Claudette. Thank you. And to Eiko, how can young people apply some of the approaches you take in the RISE program to their own personal development? That's a really good question. So, you know, we look at those rise traits that I mentioned, um, and it really comes through practice. So I would say, you know, how can you apply those rise principles in your school or in your internships or in your um, family life or beyond a university? Um, I would also say that you know, there's a lot of different programs that people can apply for where you can help cultivate that even further. So I know at universities, there's a lot of different social impact organizations that you can get 
part of or courses that you can take. So I would say really being intentional, intentional about your learning process um, and also seek out opportunities where you can cultivate that even further. Um, of course, we would love for everyone to join the RISE program um, and apply. So I can send, I can put that call to action um, in the chat as well if more people want to learn about that. Um, and I think it's really important for people to know like where, what area do you want to make uh, a sustainable impact? Because I think there's many different ways that you could approach it. Um, you could do it through philanthropy. You could do it through corporation. You could do it through uh, being a researcher or um, even through the arts. We have a lot of RISE winners who are also part of the arts and are really good at galvanizing support. Um, and so I think there's just not, there's not one way to make a difference. And that's why we look holistically um, when we select our RISE winners um, about you know, all these different traits, whether it's perseverance or brilliance or empathy or calling. Um, so it's not just one dimensional. Thank you. We were not able to address all of the questions out loud, but some have been addressed in the chat and others were represented by the answers given by the speakers. Thankfully, through the ancient room, which we will launch tomorrow, we will have a whole year to address these questions and take action. And now for wrapping up this session, thank you all to our stellar panel for a very insightful and rich conversation. Thank you to the young people in this call for the engagement and those very provocative and powerful questions. Uh, we have heard from speakers on the need of risk-informed development, but also consider systematic justice to bring pride to our ancestors and continue the progress we're making in social progress. Cecil also mentioned the need to rethink justice and how we perceive future gens and how we need to include low and middle income countries in the agenda and indigenous perspectives without tokenism. Uh, finally, Eiko made a brilliant point about the importance of talent pipelines to support early career young people. So yes, thank you for all of this. Uh, but before we leave, please do follow us on social media and connect with the different innovators. That is at Our Future Agenda on Instagram. And please continue to like and share our post. The post with most likes will be awarded the Mobilizer Award at Big Pitch on the 28th. Help them rally young people around the solutions. Also, to join us at the Big Pitch, which is tomorrow, Please scan this code or visit the ourfutureagenda.org slash big brainstorm. And this is the finishing line for the big brainstorm. And justice judges will provide their feedback. Um, and yes, that is that's it from our side. Enjoy the rest of your day.